Welcome to Brooklyn Gardens. I'm Gil McNeil and uh, it's Memorial Day 2022. A little bit of rain and a cloudy day, but we're going to do a, a little tour around my own landscape garden. There's some large rhododendrons off to my right that are just in bloom right now and there were two rescue rhododendrons that um, were probably 30 years old when I got them 20 years ago and um, they filled up the back of a small one-ton truck that we had at the time in our landscape business and I brought them up here and slid them off with the with the dump and they where they landed that's where they still are so I didn't I wasn't able to they were huge root balls so so we have vine maples off to my right they grow throughout the property there's some that um, very native ornamental tree that just grow here naturally nice small leaves and um, nice fall color you'll see there's some salals just coming you know new growth on it's really pretty you'll see a lot of hostas we'll be seeing here in a little bit i i enjoy hostas a lot so um i've got well over 100 maybe more throughout the landscape um along with you know it goes well with in the shade you know in the shade with the ferns and the salal those are all sh good shade plants and also some epimedium there is a I'm gonna see if we can get a shot. Here's a little plant that grows here as a native. It's just, let's see, yeah, it's coming into bloom and we'll get a little close up of it. Um, I've looked it up and it's, it's common name's called star flower and I don't know the botanical name, but it just has, it started in an area and it, it just travels around. It's not invasive. It's very, uh, um, I think it's a very great plant. It's deciduous, so it goes away in the wintertime, but um, very interesting plant. I don't see it in the trade or anything, but it's kind of nice to have something as a volunteer plant, that uh, native plant that you really enjoy. A little farther down the driveway uh, and behind me, you'll see, um, so we've got the Don Redwood, Metasequoia, Cliptostroboides, the Gold Rush. Um, it just I've mentioned it before, it's one of my favorite plants, and when I come down the driveway, it's something I see, it's um, a good 25 feet tall now, maybe even a little taller, and it, I've had it for probably over 15 years, and it was 8, eight to 10 feet tall when I put it in, so um, it's a fairly mature tree, and I'm, you have to give it some room, but it's considered a small to medium-sized tree, medium size, I'd say, and right behind me is a very slender Alaska weeping cedar called Green Arrow, and uh, it is well, it's at least 50 feet tall now. It was pretty good size when I put it in, um, probably... 15 to 20 years old at least when when I installed it so and that was 20 years ago when we built the house so we've been here on this property 20 years we've got a con color fir called winter gold and it's staked for a little bit of height and it's a pretty old one very slow growing a Nordman fir Abies Normania and the golden spreader again uh, really a favorite plant of mine and and off to my left is a Weeping Eastern White Pine, Pinus strobus pendula. Right up here is a giant sequoia. It's called the Blue Clone, and it's a little bit narrower and more blue than the species. And off to my right is the species tree, which is only been I planted it about five six feet tall and um, and it's been there 15 16 years and it's a good 45 feet tall or so and, and a huge uh, trunk on it and base so um, they don't always grow that fast but when plants are happy you know you, you can see what you you might expect but we have room for for trees like this and it's a pretty dramatic tree it's one of my wife's favorite trees in the on the property then off to the right is a one of about five paper bark maples that I have. They're all the same age, but I have one that's pretty good size. We'll get it a little bit later in a shot. So paper bark maples very interesting. What the most interesting part is the peeling bark. Um, and uh, on the big one, you'll see how um, dramatic it, it can be as they age and get get older. But 
pretty slow growing trees so you have to be patient with this one well we moved to the front yard and behind me is is the house and we have a little hedge to my left and and a side yard here you can see a nice weeping japanese maple that i've had for years it was good size when i moved it here um it's it's just this time of year the color is awesome that deep red purple maroon color and there's a species japanese maple right behind it just a seedling that I got out of a wholesale nursery and it was in their boneyard um, just to kind of a had a broken branch or something but it's been there for uh, many years a flowering plum um, which I don't recommend but it's been here and it's a great shade tree but they they just they're beautiful color they just sucker terribly so anytime they break branches or sometimes for no reason at all you get lots of water sprouts or suckers come off the branches um, and they're hard to maintain let's let's put it that way a mugo pine that is one of the nicer dwarf ones sherwood compacta it actually has a branch that comes off to the side i don't know if we'll be able to see it but it's all out of the same um, trunk down there but there's a branch that comes comes off here and uh, makes it makes it a little bit wider it's always nice to have a little bit of water in the landscape um, to have something right near your front door where you get the sound and that attracts birds hummingbirds and other birds this is actually an artificial rock and i used to install lots of water features over the years you know not all the time but from time to time but this one looks like a real rock um, it's made out of concrete it's hollow inside but it's um, easier to handle and it has a bird bath effect so you rarely find that in a natural rock where you have that much water at the top and and, and um, so this is they make them in different sizes and there's a, uh, a pond waterfall and pond supply right here in Mount Vernon that um, that the sells these and the pumps and everything so um, so we've enjoyed that it's a pondless one I recommend those because then you don't have the um, as many you know the mosquitoes and the algae and all that to deal with it runs clear without any chemicals so uh, anyway it's always nice to have the sound of water in your in your front yard so Max I'm going to show you a couple ground covers um, yeah, slugs like the ground cover too. So I don't know if you want to reach down and touch touch that, and then get um, and then um, smell it. Oh wow! Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's Corsican mint um, uh, ground cover in that mint family. There's lots of different mints. Very low growing, uh, sweet smelling mint mint um, smell so there's a couple other sedums mixed in here here's another ground cover blue star creeper it's in bloom right now so you, it'll get a mass of flowers on it and uh, in between the stones it's always um, nice to have some ground cover to fill in and stabilize your stones and um, your flagstone so Moving along, we've got a maidenhair fern in a pot. Different, got impatience for the color. They like the shade underneath this plum tree and the vine maple behind me, and then shade hostas, different, different ferns, some frilly ones that I don't have names of. Um, Sarca coca, which gets an early bloom and very fragrant. Uh, there's some hellebores mixed in here. Hellebores will seed themselves, and um, especially the orientalis, I think, is the one that, you know, that will do it the most. And you'll get more plants, little seedlings growing all over, and it'll just uh, cover the area. So, another paperbark maple, a Makawa yatsabusa, my older one. Um, uh, so, about four feet tall, one of the favored one of the best Japanese maples out there, slow, slow growing. Weeping larch that has a nice big trunk. That's it. And this one's our western hemlock. And there aren't very many 
cultivars out there, they're, they can't be grafted, um, so they have to be done from cuttings, and they will take from cuttings, but this one's called Thorsten's Weeping, and it'll grow flat on the ground unless you stake it. So this one was staked up about this high, and it's uh, in, inside here. We can get a little view of the, of the trunk. It's hollow in there now. I've had it for 17, 18 years, and it was probably a six, seven, eight, maybe even a 10 year old tree at the time when I got it. So, um, but it's not, you don't see it very often. It's, uh, it's so slow to come. You don't, uh, you know, it's just nice to have one if you're, if you ever come across it and want it. Um, you know, it's something that you, you, it would be it's really cool, cool for the landscape. And they take sun or shade, so that's a nice thing. So behind me is a purple fountain beach that did some really unusual things. It, uh, this one's called Purple Fountain. It usually goes, it has a leader that goes straight up in the air. Um, and then it creates a cape down at the bottom, with all, all the branches weeping down. This one, the leader went off to the side um, years ago. And, and it creates this like wall of branches coming down and then this area over here, coming over the lawn, it again, it's uh, creating that cape like it would normally do. And then I just kind of uh, prune it up so that you can walk underneath it. But uh, these leaves will continue to get more deep purple as the year goes on. So um, it adds a lot of uh, interest into the landscape with that color contrasting with your greens and blues and, and golds. Just different things, a common plant like Vi Viburnum davidi with a silver lot fur behind it. And this one, maintenance is, is important in the landscape. So this one now with that new growth and it has the little flower, this will all get cut off um, soon. I'll just go over the hedge shears and cut all this off and keep it more compact. Otherwise it'll get what we call leggy, you can see underneath, but this is, I trim some of the dead off of the underneath to show the branches, but if you don't do that, the plants get um, untidy, uh, leggy, and and they just don't, the aesthetics of it are, are not good. So um, taking care of your plants, uh, proper pruning and clean up, getting rid of debris are important to you know, keep your new landscape looking good. A Spanish fir, a, a very dwarf one called Hortzman. I'm pretty sure that's the right one. I've had it for a lot of years. Um, it has a stiffer needle than any of the spruces. So um, someone recently commented and said that, you know, that I, I call these scotch pines and that's what I was doing. And, and, and he said that it's a Scots pine, not a scotch pine. But, you know, common names can vary from region to region. I always call it scotch pine. Um, but Pinus sylvestris, anyway, it's called Little Ann. It's a dwarf version. I'm digging it for a dig next year, and it'll go to uh, one of my um, young friends that, uh, you know, um, Adam and Katie. So um, that uh, it's kind of in a spot where you know, it's growing up and blocking a little bit of the view. So it's good to kind of move it out of here, and I want to, uh, it'll get, have a, a new home soon. It's got a Pinus strobus nana. So I got this, it's grafted high on a standard and um, I got it as a pretty big specimen from Dave Helms years ago. And when I, um, you, you may mention that it, you know, this one is almost a, stand, uh, a specimen when I got it, but I've kept it somewhat cleaned out the bottom, I always kept that done and keep some separation between the paths, but this last year, um, I'm, I'm thinking just let it go a little bit more and became uh, a more, the branches and, and uh, needles just kind of grow together and become a, uh, you know, not so much separation throughout the, the trees. So um, we've got a mugo pine and we just saw one over by the pond called Sherwood Compacta. This one's grafted on a standard, higher. Um, and 
standards come in and out of fashion, but uh, the, it's nice to have some in your yard. Um, it puts the plant up a little bit higher, especially smaller dwarfs and miniatures, and then you can still have an understory plants around it that show nicely. And off to my right is a Japanese maple called Villa Toronto, which is, I think, is one of the best Japanese maples out there. It's green, but it always has it has a little bit of red on the fringe of the leaf, and it's fairly old. It's you know it's, it's a tree that's close to 20 years old, and it's no more than eight feet tall, but probably eight to ten feet wide. Um, this is mine. I know it's a, a slower growing version, and um, I had a little bit of snow damage. A branch broke out from the snow. We had pretty good snow loads up here this year and broke some of my maples out, so along with those Leyland cypress we talked about earlier. So behind me is uh, uh, my lion's head maple, uh, Acer palmatum shisha gashira, and it is well, it's about, looks like about 15 feet tall now. So um, it's, you know, one of the favored Japanese maples with a very congested, curly type, small leaf. Has an upright growth and uh, nice, nice fall color and then kind of a, a, a yellow or gold color to it. This one always catches, especially as even a small plant, a one gallon plant. Uh, it's a Pinus strobus, but it has a, twisted needle and, and in Max will get a close-up of that but it, um, it it's it's a real eye-catcher um, this green twist is more shrub like and on these you can if they get out of hand you can candle them you can do some reduction in the winter time by taking out your 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 center I do that and take this uh, center branch out the leader and then let the others fill out you could do some candling on it as well, but this one here has enough space and I can let it get bigger. I take grafts off this one and it's been grafted uh, for a couple of years now. That, that is a really nice plant. Next to me is a stump. So a tree that's probably been dead for quite a few years and, and um, so there's a story that goes with this tree and, and it came to me by way of my father-in-law and his mother um, had it in at her um, home in Anacortes, Washington, and then originally it came from north of Spokane, where her family settled and had um, several hundred acres of uh, property in the early 1900s, and she grew up there. So there was a great fire in um, part of eastern Washington and Montana and Idaho in the early 1900s, and um, and this could have been a dead stump or it could have been something that was burned out you can see the char on the inside of it, um, it the story is that it, it was a tamarack and tamarack is a type of in common name for larch and so um, when they moved when the family moved to western washington they pecked this stump up that they had that came through the fire and it was in her parents possession and hers and then my father-in-law's and and now um, my wife and I have it so um, it's very interesting underneath the bark here all the swirling pattern of the wood it's hollow inside um, it might be something that you know could go to maybe a museum might be interesting or something and it, it is particularly in that Spokane area eastern Washington that um, you know as part of uh, something that came through the fires happy to have it in my yard for a number of years now so thanks for joining us on this Memorial Day and I hope you enjoyed it be sure to subscribe to our channel and um, be sure to give us a thumbs up and we'll see you next time <laughs>